Love, joy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Our text is from Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. That's the text. The Bible says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. There are, of course, many examples of this throughout the Bible, but perhaps none greater than the fall of of Peter. You just heard how it went down, but I thought it might be helpful tonight if we tried to imagine what Peter felt about it all on this night following his denial of Jesus. So, let's take a look. They say a rooster crowing is God's wake-up call. Yeah, that's, uh, at least that's the way it was for me. Everything, that, that whole night was a blur, all right? Um, I didn't comprehend, none of us could comprehend everything that was going on, all right? We were all in the upper room, Jesus was washing our feet. Um, then we were in the garden, Jesus goes off to pray by himself. I fell asleep. I'm not proud of it. I had a big meal. Bread makes me sleepy. Next thing we know, me, James, and John, Jesus is in our face, and he's trying to wake us up, and uh, he said, um, what is he said, uh, the, the, uh, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, and, and then before we know it, Judas is kissing Jesus on the cheek. I try to go help him. I cut off this guard's ear. For the record, I wasn't aiming for his ear. I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman. And then they, uh, they arrest Jesus, and they take him off, and we... We ran. And it wasn't but two hours earlier that we were in the upper room. I was looking at him. I was looking him right in the eye saying, if everyone disowns you, Jesus, I won't. I'm with you. I love you. And I think that's what made me stop, turn around, go back. And uh, I caught a glimpse of Jesus as they were taking him to the high priest's house. Stood at the gate, and some girl comes up to me, starts pointing at me. 
starts going, you, you're with him. You're with this man that claims to be the son of God. You're one of his disciples. I felt like every eye was on me. So I just brushed her off. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong guy. I get my way into the courtyard and uh, it's cold. I, I try to warm up by the fire. And then there's this guy that recognizes me and he is uh, from the ear incident, you know, and starts going, get him, get him. He's with him, just arrest him, get him. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, all right? I wasn't with him. It was easier the second time to deny him. It was some time right before morning and um, this wise guy, he comes up to me and goes, who are you kidding, all right? Who are you fooling? You're with him. I can tell by your accent. I'm like, this is just the way I talk, all right? And, and the whole night, they kept pushing him around. They kept beating him. They kept spitting on him, throwing insults at him. And I couldn't take it anymore. I had enough. I was tired of people accusing me, looking at me. And I, and I just, I said a few things that I'm not proud of, but I was like, leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing, all right? Just leave him alone. I wasn't with him. And that's when I heard the most blood-curdling sound I ever heard in my whole life. I heard that rooster crow. And at that moment, Jesus, he turns around and he looks at me. He looks at me. And his gaze, you can't escape his gaze. I mean, when his eyes are on you, you cannot escape it. And they arrested him and they took him off. I will die with you, Jesus. If, everyone, if everybody disowns you, I will die with you. What a, what a joke. I mean, what would you do? At that moment, at that time, I ran. I ran so fast, I ran so long. And you know what they did? They killed him. He's dead. Jesus is not dead. He is alive and lives forevermore. He won the victory through the open tomb. We don't have to pretend that Easter hasn't happened. But on that night, Peter didn't know that. He didn't know a lot of things. He only knew his sin and his denial of his Lord. The Bible says he went outside and wept bitterly. This picture is presented, I think, beautifully in this simple line drawing from the Good News for Modern Man Bible. So the crowing rooster has become throughout the ages a symbol for denying Christ. In fact, about a thousand years ago, a papal edict instructed all of the churches in Christendom to put a rooster on their steeples. It was meant to remind congregations to guard against denying their Lord as Peter did. I thought if only we could hear a rooster crow every single time we denied our Lord in thought, word, or deed, we would be waking up all the time to our sin and to our shame. Interesting side note, of course, is that once people found out that the rooster could also be used as a weather vane, that kind of took over and it lost some of its significance. But kind of interesting, the weather vane telling which way the wind was blowing and very ironic in a symbolic sense for telling which way the wind was blowing dur during Holy Week. Judas, sensing that the wind was blowing against Jesus, literally 
sold Jesus out. Peter, lining up with the prevailing wind, denied his Lord. The religious leaders, with the wind at their backs, condemned Jesus and demanded his death. Pilate, at first reluctant to give in to that wind, finally was swept away by it and delivered Jesus over to be crucified. And we remember, of course, how the crowds changed as the winds changed between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. But folks, the next time you see a weathercock, and I have one over at the house if you want to stop over, I want you to notice that unlike a wind sock or a flag that goes with the wind, the weathercock faces into the wind, showing its direction by remaining steadfastly against the wind rather than with it. I believe that speaks powerfully to how you and I need to live out our Christian faith. At one point in his teaching of the disciples, Jesus told them something very important. He said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Folks, that statement was not spoken lightly. Jesus knew he was facing the cross, and he knew that some of them literally would have to face a cross of their own. He was preparing them for that moment. Peter, of course, thought he was up for the challenge. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. But of course, when he had the chance, he blew it. German Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in the days when he was trying to lead the confessing church to be true to the Word of God and to resist the evils of the Nazi regime, wrote an important book called The Cost of Discipleship. In it, he said, to deny yourself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self, to see only Him who goes before and no more the road that is too hard for us. Only when we have become completely oblivious of self are we ready to bear the cross for his sake. Of course, he sealed the truth of his own words with his martyrdom, the hands of Hitler. Peter, of course, uh, had trouble denying himself. In the courtyard, he made the, mis the same mistake when he tried to walk on water, if you recall. He did okay when he kept his eyes on Jesus, but when he took his eyes off to the wind and to the waves, he immediately began to sink. Peter <clears throat> was a work in progress. and He certainly wasn't at that time ready to bear a cross for Christ. Are you? So tonight we have our eighth grade confirmands. For First Communion. And Maundy Thursday, a great day for that event. Receiving the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus that he instituted on this night, connected to the bread and wine, for the deeply personal and intimate forgiveness of sins that is yours when you confess your sins and turn to him in faith. In a few weeks, our eighth graders are going to make literally the same vow that Peter made. That even if all others fall away, you will not fall away. That you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it. I pray that you won't take that vow lightly. Like some before you decide after Confirmation Sunday that you can't even suffer to get out of bed on a Sunday morning to come and worship your Lord Jesus who died for you. Guys, I guarantee you, should the Lord tarry, there will be many opportunities for you to face a cross and carry a cross for Christ. You won't have to go out and look for it. It will come to you if you truly decide to deny yourself and follow him. And I can almost guarantee you also that at times you will fail. Like the rest of us, 
you will give in to that pressure and compromise your Christian faith. And in those moments, I want you to remember something. Jesus instituted this sacrament and gave it to people who in a few short hours were going to either deny him, run away from him, or betray him altogether. And he knew what they were going to do. He loved them nonetheless and gave them a way back to him. In the Lord's Supper, you kneel and repent and receive not just bread and wine, not just a symbol. He gives you here what he offered you there on the cross, his very body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And he gives you here a new start, a new opportunity to take up your cross and follow him. When Peter faced his denial, he wept bitterly. But he didn't stop with regret, which traps you in the past, in that sin. He went on to repentance that frees you for a new life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Repentance faces the cross and the forgiveness Christ won there. It also faces the open tomb and the victory of Jesus. And after the resurrection, that is truly what happened in the lives of Peter and all of the disciples. They changed. They truly faced their denials and changed. All of the disciples were martyred, as were at least 147 Christians today in Kenya for their faith. We're told in Acts 12 that James, son of Zebedee, was put to death by the sword by King Herod Agrippa. Church fathers tell us that Peter was crucified upside down because he did not consider himself worthy to die the same way Christ died. Hippolytus tells us that Andrew was nailed to an olive tree. Thomas, called Doubting Thomas, was anything but as he was thrust through with pine spears, tormented with red-hot plates, and finally burned alive. Philip was also tortured and crucified. Matthew, who wrote the words of our text tonight, was beheaded for following Christ. Nathaniel, who was the first to confess that Jesus was the Son of God, was flayed and crucified. James, son of Alphaeus, sometimes called James the Less, who was appointed to be head of the church in Jerusalem, was taken to the top of the temple, to the highest part of the temple, where Satan took Jesus in his temptation. He was displayed to the crowd that gathered, given the opportunity to renounce Christ. He chose to confess Christ boldly and was thrown down to his death. Simon called the Zealot was zealous for Christ and preached the gospel in Egypt, in Cyrene, in Africa, in Mauritania, in Britain, Libya, and Persia, and was finally crucified in Syria. Judas Thaddeus was beat to death with rods after preaching the risen Christ to pagan priests in Mesopotamia. Matthias was stoned while hanging on a cross. The apostle Paul was beheaded at the hands of the emperor Nero in Rome. And they were all ready and willing, almost eager to suffer all of this as Peter would write to us, because we are looking forward to a new heaven, the home of righteousness. They were looking forward to a better life in their true home, in their resurrected bodies. There's a legend that tells that every time Peter heard a rooster crow after that experience, he knelt down and wept. But you know, I doubt that very much. Yes, I think Peter would have remembered his sin and his denial every time he heard the rooster crow. But he also knew that Christ had gone to the cross to win for him forgiveness of sins and that he had removed his sins from him as far as the east is from the west. I would like to think that every time Peter heard that rooster crow, it would have reminded him instead of Christ's amazing and patient love that cleansed him and restored his faith. Remember that look that Jesus gave to Peter the instant 
The rooster crowed, Luke tells us that. It wasn't in our reading today. That as soon as the rooster crowed, the eyes of Jesus and Peter locked. What do you think was in that look? Judgment? Wrath? Not at all. I submit to you that in that look is the same thing you are about to receive in what we know as the Lord's Supper. Holy Communion is Christ looking right at you and at your sin and saying, I forgive you. I love you. Come home. So let his love sink deeply into your souls tonight as you eat his body and drink his blood and receive him and resolve once more to deny yourself and follow him. Amen. May the peace of God, which is beyond our ability even to understand it, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.